Hello and welcome to CD Oasis. My name is Shiraz Gessayer. After a brief period of absence, I am pleased to welcome once again Dr. Paul Vilziki, General Dentist from Toronto. He is here to continue the implant series with a new case that he has just completed. Dr. Vilziki, it's a pleasure to see you and know that you're doing well. Thank you for sharing your expertise and knowledge with our audience. Welcome to CD Oasis. Thank you and uh, welcome everybody. Just trying to survive COVID like everybody else. <laughs> I hope that you had a reopening of practice that was easy. Um, before we go and see the presentation, can you tell us, as usual, what it is about? What is the key message that you're trying to convey? Uh, as I've said before, I like to be in control of everything. And from start to finish, sometimes that doesn't happen. Uh, you get a handoff of a case from somebody else. And this is such a case. Uh, it's very complicated. There's just a lot of small problems, a multitude of problems, and each one of them, ha each one of them has to be assessed, anticipated, and knocked off. And then you turn around and you say, hey, no more problems, I guess I'm finished. <laughs> I like a phrase that you made when we were scoping the case. You said that it was, this case was to test all your clinical knowledge and experience. We're going to see that when we see the case. However, a note, just a note on that. I did, I was looking at some of the other Oasis posts, not more than 10 minutes ago. And I see, should we really be restoring teeth? Should we just go directly to implants? And then I saw minimally invasive dentistry. I apologize to everybody for the length of my cases and the length of these presentations. Minimally invasive dentistry does not come to this office. I don't know why. I'd love to have it, I just don't. Cases that come to me are long and complex. And it does take 40 minutes, 15 minutes, some of them an hour to try to get through everything I have to go through to get success. It takes me a long time to do these presentations. I wish I could do them shorter, but I think the viewer will miss out on important information. So you want minimally invasive dentistry? You gotta go somewhere else. <laughs> I think your, your viewers will, will forgive you for that since okay. cases are really very good cases. Now, this case specifically has a, a special place in your heart because it was the last one done by your late lab technician, Dennis DeMarkey. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's correct. Um, he was instrumental in the, in the final success of this case, and it was during a difficult time where he was undergoing chemotherapy for lymphoma. And my, my experiences in practice have always revolved around the relationships I have with my patients, my staff, and my lab technicians. I'm the type of person, I like people to like me, the ones that I'm working, that I've wor that I'm working with, because I, if I have to give my money to somebody, I'd rather give it to somebody that I like. And I like Dennis very, very much. And the evolution of his help will best be explained in the presentation. Perfect. Thank you for that uh, clarification and those details. Shall we go and see the presentation? Yes, we shall. Hello, everybody. Grab a coffee, sit back. This is a bit of a long one. So going with the theme of all of these posts, it's who's responsible and what is that responsibility? I'm a solo practitioner that provides periodontal surgery, endodontics, and restorative dentistry from simple to complex. But I don't necessarily place implants. I've just never been comfortable with that. So I have to rely on oral surgeons and periodontists for that. But still, it's my responsibility to coordinate all phases of treatment to deliver long lasting restorations because that's what I would want if I'm sitting in the chair and I'm sure that's what one you would want if you're sitting in the chair. And after some 40 years, this has often proven to be the case. I've restored successfully just about everything there is to restore in dentistry from simple to complex. 
And for 20, for the past 20 of those years, I've extensively photographed my work and I use that as proof of, of what I've done and what works. And I'm fond of saying I'm doing it old school. By that, I mean, I rely on evidence-based protocols. I'm not inclined to reinvent the wheel. I'm inclined to use materials and manufacturers with a pr proven track record. I am driven by a fear of failure, particularly when it comes to implants, because so much is on the line, so much cost, so much stress and what a patient has to go under psychologically and physiologically. So you have to succeed on these things. And I'm a firm believer that success is a planned event. You don't bump into it and say, whoop de do, I got it. Every detail must be anticipated, identified and managed effectively. And all of this is my responsibility. There are no shortcuts to success. So in my office where I use surgeons to place the implants, it's a team sport. And I feel that I am the quarterback. I must conceptualize the entire case from start to finish in order to feel comfortable. I can't turn around to a patient after the fact and say, oh, you know, it doesn't look so good because the surgeon didn't put it in the right place or the lab didn't get the right shade. That just won't fly. All of those things are just bad excuses. So I need to be in control from start to finish. I have to know and direct the role of each team player and appreciate all their strengths and weaknesses, including my own, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at. And it's my responsibility to avoid a fumble. But sometimes you get a handoff. And this is such a case. I got a call from a colleague in a panic. He was, he was redoing his office. He was in somebody else's office and he calls me. Patient was just at the oral surgeon, had the healing abutments, the healing cylinders placed, second stage surgery, and she's upset because in five days she's going to Italy. And the partial does not fit. Can I help? And he said, quite frankly, Paul, I think I'm a little bit in over my head. Consider taking over the case. I said, okay, let me see what I'm up against. Let me call the surgeon. Phone the surgeon, and he explains to me the same thing. Lack of communication, sutures are in. She's got to get off to Italy, and the partial doesn't fit. Can you make the partial fit? So I said, in short order, just send her right over right now. And she presented. She came in. Uh, she's about my age, small little Italian lady, brings in her husband, they're both in my operatory, and this is often difficult when you have husband and wife show up. Like, who do you direct your attention to? But I can see they're both visibly upset. The story goes, she had two centrals, they had been root canal, the one broke, then another broke. I'm really not quite sure of the timing of this. They went for one implant and then they end up with a periodontist and then with an oral surgeon for bone grafting. It was a long involved story, but the woman turns to me in tears and says, had I have known, I would have had to have gone through all of this. I would have had all my teeth taken out and a denture put in. Okay, Paul, do your thing. So I just, I just said to her husband, what do you do for a living? And the reason I often ask that question is, I want to know what their history is. So I know how to tailor an answer. So I know what to say to them to explain problems to a patient in terms that they might understand. And he said he was a contractor, renovator. And I said, have you ever been called out to a site? We got a leaking basement fixer. Well, what is it? What are you going to do? You have to investigate. And sometimes a simple problem ends up being a difficult problem. So I said, let, you've got to go to Italy in five days. Let me try something stupid. Because I was trying to set the bar as low as possible for myself. So let me just try something stupid. Before I start trying to get maybe um, uh, fixed provisionals on this right now, let me try something stupid. I took her partial, 
cut the flange off so it would sit passively and then just flooded the underbelly of it with some pink denture acrylic, let it harden, took it out of the mouth. Typically I'll go to my lab and grind it, but I did all of it in front, in front of her husband so he could see. I'm working with my hands much the way he might. I fashioned it, I smoothed it, I polished it all in front of him. I parked it in her mouth. I gave her a mirror, quite proud of myself. And I said, here, try this and see. Look in the mirror and see what you think. And this is what she saw. And this for the first time, I saw it as well. The woman had an unforgiving smile line. Jokingly, we would say that her smile is somewhere up around her eyebrow. Well, in cases like this, there is nowhere to hide. There's no way, place to camouflage or hide a defect. It's all there. And she's not even smiling. She's just merely parting her lips. There's no smile here. I couldn't look. I, I turned away and I thought, boy, oh boy, uh, am I going to get it now? And I hear, hey, this looks fine. I can go to Italy like that. And I said, really? And she said, really? I said, wonderful. If you want, we'll continue when you come back, if you want to come back to this office. And she said yes. In coordination with the referring dentist. I knew right then and there, this case was going to test me. It was going to call upon all of my clinical experience, both technically and artistically, to make something that I could live with, that I just wouldn't insert and have to turn away. In these large cases, you have to do a very thorough case workup. And I spend a lot of time doing that. I get the Panorex from the oral surgeon, and I'm fond of saying what a pan shows me, I don't need to see. What I need to see, a pan doesn't show. So in my office, I shoot film still. I took some periapicals and start to tease out what are the issues. Well, there's an implant near halfway up the root of that lateral that poses a problem. This one, it's a little bit better, but still halfway up the root. There's a cuspid here that has been endodontically treated after the bridge was cemented in. So I have to worry about what is the underlying structure of tooth material that's securing that bridge. The lateral was endodontically treated in the past, cast post core, thankfully with a separate crown. This I found out from the uh, dentist that placed it. Yes, there's a small radiolucent area at the apex. It's been like this, I have been told for years. The tooth is totally asymptomatic. And um, on this, at, on this view, it's not as dramatic. And I've seen things like this in my own patients that I've followed for decades and nothing's really ever happened. And if it's longstanding and asymptomatic, I don't feel I have to jump in necessarily and treat this. But I registered it. And the cylinders are five by five. She returned from her vacation. And this is how she presents. Tissue is beginning to heal quite nicely. Investigating uh, the remainder of the dentition, make notes of the recession. I number all the teeth. All of these images get included in a very lengthy letter to the patient before we start. It may have been five, six pages long because as the scope of treatment increases, then so does our responsibility to inform a patient. And I think that was part of the problem with the miscommunication with the implants. Some people think I'm going to the surgeon, I'm going to get the implants put in and that's it. Well, it's not it. It has to be explained very carefully to them. And I was wondering, okay, I've got, I've got gingiva at this height, how am I going to blend that and marry that with, the, with gingiva at that height? From the palatal aspect, there was a bit of redness on the palatal aspect of uh, tooth 16. And indeed there was some sort of defect on the root. 
And the radiograph is quite telling there's decay at the distal margin. So this bridge has to be redone. At some point, bridge has to be redone. And then I'm looking at the cuspid and the lateral thinking, what do I do? Both weak teeth. If I'm remaking the bridge, would I remake it with double abutting these two teeth? Do, do I give thought to perhaps extracting tooth 12, taking out the lateral, and maybe making uh, two crowns on the centrals, two splinted crowns, and cantilever, cantilevering off of a lateral. Just some of the permutations, the things I've bumped into in the past that I, that I could apply to this case. These are all the things that go through my mind. And I'm sorry invasive dentistry just didn't, or minimally invasive dentistry didn't in, enter into this. I've got recession here. That lateral uh, was not endodontically treated. And I had worried about fracturing, fracturing of that lateral, much the same as how she fractured her centrals. And I just thought, I just can't put two crowns on these two teeth and leave the laterals or the teeth unattended on the other side. I thought that would be a recipe for disaster. And there was decay. There was decay uh, at the mesial of crown 24. So I, I thought I'm into replacing or placing four splinted crowns on these teeth because it's my responsibility to over engineer strength. I want to fix this. I want to fix this once. I don't want to fix the two front teeth. She comes back at a later date with problems in the lateral. And then I have to junk all of that to try to remake something else or possibly send her for implants again, which she wasn't thrilled about. So that post about, do we fix teeth or just take them out and put an implants? Sometimes it's a tough sell for a patient. First order of business, get rid of the partial, make some transmucosal abutments on which to put on some provisional crowns. Doing it old school, stone models, building it out with some plasticine. I make, or my staff makes the custom trays here in the office, leaving a lot of room in this area because I know that the transfer copings, the impression copings will probably come out through that flange, remove the cylinders, place in the implant transfer copings, and then I just put a little bit more acrylic here, punch some holes through so I can gain easy access to those screws. I use an open tray technique and you have to in this case because if it's closed, you'll never get the tray out. The tray wants to come down and those two implants or those, that, those impression copings will not let it come out easily. So here these just get unscrewed after the silicone sets retrieve it, put in the implant analogs, goes off to the lab, and a model is prepared. Now I can finally see what am I up against. I need to have stone models in my hand that I can look at. And now I can assess all of the problems. I've got implants going off at this angle. I have teeth that want to go in this direction. And there's over 30 millimeter, dif uh, sorry, there's 30 degree difference here, which I can discern with the $1 protractor that I bought. I asked the lab to come up with custom made abutments. At the time, Dennis wasn't feeling too well. He was in and out of the office. I had talked to him and he said, let's go with custom made abutments in the office that are waxed up in gold. And I asked them to provide me with two acrylic temporaries out of methyl methacrylate that I could add and subtract from. And I asked for a little bit of acrylic here, a uh, pink acrylic, to see if I could mask that discrepancy or hide that discrepancy in crown length between the laterals and the centrals. 
So I got this back. These are, as I said, cast gold. Here's the impression with a bit of silicone to replicate the soft tissue. And I could not get the coping or the abutment rather back onto the implant on the stone log. So I knew there was no way this is gonna go down in the mouth. And I look from the lingual and I see a pronounced ledge in that area. I took some time to trim that away so it would seat passively on the stone model. I think had Dennis have been there, he would have picked up on it. But sometimes you're just not lucky. So I did the same thing, replicated that design on the other abutment. And what I'm trying to do is develop some harmonious geometry with the host tissue. Well, I got that to fit and it fit in the mouth quite nicely. But then I stepped back, I looked at it, took this picture, added notes to it, sent it off to the lab. Took an hour to refine both abutments. Then I called it quits. Margin extends much too deep at the mesial aspect. We'll never get an impression. And I don't want margin this deep and close to the implant. Because as we know, a great way to have an implant fail is to have a, a cemented crown too deep, subgingival, where you can't access the cement and you end up with a horrible periodontitis and failure. So I don't wanna do that. Please remake. And what I should have said was, please wax it up and show me before you cast. But they went to completion and I got these pictures back from the lab. I can't say that I was thrilled, but I said, okay, it's a starting point. Send the case to me. I'll assess it without the patient here. I like using this picture. And I've said before, dentistry is a craft of the hand. I have to combine science with a healing art in order to have a restoration that will prove successful. And it's a kinetic knowledge expressed by the act of doing. You have to do this. You have to learn. So here I am crafting with my hands. I took some wax and started waxing up on these gold abutments, the shape that I thought would be acceptable. Because who better than me to come up with a shape? So here I am crafting away, knowing that I would return this to the lab and because it's gold, all they have to do is cast onto this material. They don't have to remake the whole thing. And what I'm trying to do is develop geometry that will be harmonious with host tissue. It was returned quite nicely, just as I had designed. And now I felt a lot better. I've got a good length of collar here. The margin finish, finishes just below the gum line, at least on, this, on the model it did. So my goal is to support the tissue without stress. I don't want it too bulky in order that it may overstress the tissue and the tissue may react. It may react positively, it may react negatively. I don't know. So I want to stress it as little as possible. And I've learned by doing this in my own mouth where I had under contoured this area and I ended up with a bit of a depression. So I've learned trial and error, not too thick, not too thin, and to be very careful to stay away from structures adjacent to the implants and the analog and the abutments. I don't wanna to be too close to the teeth. I don't wanna to be too close to the bone. And I wanna leave enough room that tissue can regenerate and live and have a good blood supply. Put in the abutments, first one, then the other. Then I gave her a little bit of local, popped in a bit of retraction cord and started to work on these provisionals. Because it's methyl methacrylate, I can add and subtract any number of times. And that's the design I came up with. 
all I basically did was work within the parameters of the two permanent la uh, laterals that were here and split the difference. And that's, that's, all, that's the, all the leeway I had. Put it in the mouth. What do you think? That's wonderful. It's wonderful. Just finish. I want to finish with dentistry. Just, it, it looks wonderful. In these sorts of cases where, yeah, it's good when a patient gives you some feedback. At least you can get a consensus. But when they leave it all up to you, that's, that's an, an even bigger responsibility to nail it down correctly. When it's all left on me. And she said, look, whatever you give me is fine. I said, okay, now, now I have to struggle not just to please you, but to please myself. And I'm a hard person to please. Came in on a subsequent appointment, and now we're going to remove the bridge on the right side. Again, recall we have two separate teeth here. I'm worried about what am I going to find under the retainer, given that the endo was done after the bridge was cemented in. I'm worried about having just one lateral here. And of course, there's the decay there. Thankfully, uh, the dentist that referred her to me told me that he had put in the cast post core crown, sorry, cast post core, and the crown was separate, which is great because all you have to do then is just slice down the metal to the core and peel away the rest of the material, peel away the crown. Sometimes the crown pops off, but in this case, a resin material was used and it was, it was somewhat difficult to get off, but it came off. And that core took a lot of abuse. If that would have been composite resin or some carbon fiber post, I would have destroyed it. But, uh, but metal, metal is a wonderful material to work with. And so I was able to get that off quite nicely. Now I look back at the film and I said, okay, I've got a root going this way yet I've got a crown going that way. And I could feel by the prominence of where the root was, I've got a root somewhere there and I've got that canted off to the side. Just made a, just made a note, okay, maybe it might be possible to shave that down a little bit and put back the anatomy of what a lateral should look like. Again, just, just a mental note, cut off the retainer from the 16. Thankfully, the decay was kind of superficial, didn't bury into the tooth. So it's just a matter of refining the margin. Now I have to restore the 13. And there's no better way I find or I think to restore a cuspid or any anterior endodontically treated teeth than with, than with a metal cast post cord crown. I hear there are controversies, but none exist at my office because for decades I've put these in. And if designed properly with an accurate impression and a good length of post engaging ferrule, it will be successful. I noted fibrous tissue in these areas. So did a little bit of uh, gum surgery. And sometimes gum surgery can be very minimal and very simple. It doesn't have to be flaps and nauseous recontouring and all the rest of it. In this instant, I just lopped off some of these fibrous pads. That gave me some crown length to work with at the mesial and distal aspect of these teeth. And then went on to fabricate provisionals using old school powder liquid methyl methacrylate. So to do this, you take a shell of acetate, vacuum form over the model, and I will often put in some blue blockout material to give me a bit more of a reservoir of material to work with there. Well, you can see uh, the shell that's generated. Pop that back on the teeth so it's indexed by the two centrals anteriorly, and there's a seven back there. Put a lot of Vaseline on these teeth and then, and there you can see the shell. So put a lot of Vaseline and then just flood it with resin material, pop it onto the teeth and then remove it when it's at its doughy stage. 
Once it sets, it's easy to just pop those two teeth loose because there's some Vaseline on it. Trim away the excess. Using methyl methacrylate, there is some shrinkage. So I know this is a two-step affair. Knock off the excess, hollow grind the interior, make sure that it fits as, as, as well as I can, knowing that the margin's not there, but then just flood it, the retainers, with some new resin, pop it onto the teeth, and I will capture that margin as if I'm capturing it in an impression. And now it's just a matter of removing it, knocking off the excess with sandpaper disc, and inserting it. So provisionals, old school. Methyl methacrylate adds to itself. That's important in these big cases, long drawn out cases, where the anatomy will end up invariably changing from appointment to appointment until I've got it to the where I want it. So I need a material that adds to itself. I don't want to keep remaking provisionals. And the, this material is robust. It doesn't crack. It doesn't break. It's not brittle. Old school. Old school provisionals. So I'm making progress. I've got solid temps on the centrals. I've got proper fitting temps on the right side. Patient comes back. There's our little cuspid. If you're married to digital and you don't have impression material and you can't make a cast post core. So you can see there, it, it engages a bit of ferrule here, has good length to it and it's cemented in. And I've refined this one. I've trimmed away some of the mesial aspect. Now I have two teeth now that I can anchor the Queen Mary to. I am not worried about disintegration of porcelain, sorry, of, uh, of composite resin. I don't have to worry about the resin around a fiber, post carbon fiber. It's metal, it's going nowhere. Once that's inserted, I have to refit the provisionals all over again. And that was done again. Now patient comes back <clears throat> attacking the left side. That was that standalone lateral, which had not been endodontically treated, and I removed that. And once I saw this, I was very happy that I decided to make this part of an overall reconstruction because there's precious little robust tooth material to support a crown. And given the patient's bite, she split the centrals. She'd probably crack the lateral. I've seen that often enough on teeth that have not been endodontically treated to know I better over-engineer over strength into these four teeth. I removed the crown, found decay in this area, and I'm right down into the sulcus here. Well, with enough retraction cord, I was able to just get a feather edge margin, remove the decay, didn't violate the canal, put in a pin retained amalgam core. But before I did that here, I snapped off some radiographs. So here you can see, there's not a whole hell of a lot left of that lateral. And here you can see the design that I, that I sculpted in the crown abutment for that implant, where I tried to accommodate where the level of the bone is and not to impinge on harder soft tissue. Getting back to the 24. So I have crest of bone here and I have some semblance of tooth material there. Not a lot, but as I said, muscling it, I was able to get a pin retained amalgam core. I love amalgam because if you try to use resin in this instant, I doubt you could get proper isolation without resin or, so, or some fluid coming up and contaminating your bond. Amalgam doesn't care. It will set in the presence of moisture. So I knew I would have to address that. Again, 
making provisionals on the back shell over a model. And I thought now is an opportune time to address the shape. Dennis had come into the office. He took a look at it, gave me a few words of advice and left. And then I spent the next hour or so reconfiguring the front smile. And I'll go over this in more detail at the end. And being able to shift the cant in the proper direction, recall that initially I had the cast post core where the core came off towards the midline. So I was able to redress the core so it allowed me to move all the embrasures over and correct that. And that's the art, that's the art of dentistry. You're not gonna find this in textbooks. You know, it's not something where it's a step-by-step. -step. And this is what I mean about clinical experience, working with your hands, doing this, failing at it, redoing it, failing at it, redoing it again until it's just right. I can't tell you the amount of times I have to add and subtract acrylic. From, from this procedure, but I nailed it with Dennis's help. And it was creating provisionals. And this is the art part of dentistry. The cant was in that inclination because at that time I was restricted by the laterals that were there. Once I was able to play with the shape of the laterals, I could shift that all over. Removed at a subsequent appointment, I knew I'd have to come back to this area. Pull off the temps, I've got bleeding. The temps were made with every bit of dedication to detail here, here, and here where I have no bleeding as I did here. It wasn't the faulty margin. It's just the body's red flag. It's screaming. You violated rule number one, must not violate the biologic width which is that delicate barrier between the body inside, the connective tissue, and the world outside, all the bugs and organisms that are around the teeth and the oral cavity. And I, I violated it. Just to go over this, refresh this in your mind, fit and finish of restorations are paramount. Because that biologic width from bone to the top of the gingival sulcus that's about two and a half, three millimeters. When we engage subgingibly and we, we, we want to bury a margin, ideally we just want to pop it into the sulcus, that potential space. We're dealing in the real world, particularly with this case where I'm getting deeper. And the deeper I go, the harder it is to get an impression. And you don't want to end up with a restoration that's sticking away from the tooth structure. It will be another source of irritation. Will the body accommodate to it? Will it not? The deeper you go, the harder it is to get an accurate margin. And this is the last thing you want to do. You don't want to slam restorative material deep into the connective tissue, which is essentially what I did in making this provisional because I didn't have a choice at the time, just ran out of time. So this image, of just engaging the sulcus is burned into my memory. Every time I've got a drill and I, it's in my hand and I'm approaching the, the gingiva, this is the, this is the picture that comes to mind. This is what I want to end up with. So I've got to create that here. So this is what periodontal surgery is for. So all these fancy new labels of dentistry, minimally invasive, comprehensive, I don't know where people come up with these labels. It's just good dentistry driven by accepted protocols of treatment. So here, I don't have enough tooth surface, root surface for good attachment. So I have to go make it. I raised a small flap because I did not want to lift the flap and engage this area. This tissue was starting to heal and come along quite nicely. So I just raised it a little bit here so I could address interproximally between these teeth. Doesn't have to be a huge flap. 
here, my minimally invasive flap, if you will. What I did was carve a little bit of bone away. You could use a rotary instrument. My favorite is just a sharp scalpel because you can cleave it. It's like, it's like cleaving soap, carving soap. You cleave it a little bit and a little bit comes away very atraumatically, very slowly, because it's easy to take off too much. Once you're taking off too much, you can't put it back. So I like to do this incrementally, slowly, slowly, let the flap fall back, see where the papilla is. If I think I need a little bit more, take a little bit more bone away. Do I need to address the margins? If I want to take that down, that will dictate a little bit more bone removal. And you just play it back and forth, back and forth, which is why as a restoring dentist, it's just not the restoration of teeth. It's the restoration of the entire complex. Now I've got this area to address right here, the critical area, and let's zoom in on it. This is a little bit of calculus. And that's what you often find when you're deep subgingively, you can be scaling for as long as you want. Raise a flap, I guarantee you're still following calculus because it, you just don't know going in blindly. You raise a flap and you're often surprised of what you've left behind. So here I've got a margin right there. I have the amalgam core very close to the margin. I don't like that. If I'm putting a crown on, I think I have to entomb the core and tooth structure as one. I don't and I have never placed a finish line half on tooth and half on restorative core material. I think it's a recipe for disaster. And that's all the tooth structure I have to deal with that's left for me. My crown's gonna go on there. So what I did was shave a little bit of bone away in between. I'm sorry it's a bit difficult to see taking, an, taking a photograph when it's bleeding, it, it's difficult. But trust me, I took about that much bone away. And now I've developed far more surface area for epithelial attachment. Zooming back out, I don't want to address this area right now. You never, ever want to carve amalgam in the presence of a flap. You'll pulverize this material. It'll get on, onto the bone and you'll never flush it away. You'll end up with an amalgam tattoo. So you have to wait till tissue has healed. Replace my provisionals, which are accurately fitting. They have to be, because the provisionals help guide the healing. That's the interplay. That's the, the comprehensive dentistry, if you will. You need everything to work in concert to get a good result. So the provisionals are properly fitting. Here I've taken that picture I've shown you before, just flipped it upside down so it makes more sense. There's the bone, there's my margin, and there's all the surface area, the dimension I have for biologic width. I've got, I've created my two or three millimeters. Stitched it up and in a month or so she comes back I don't need a textbook to tell me. I don't need a professor to tell me. The body's telling me, you've done good. The skin is pink, healthy. As compared to this. So now go take your impression. Now it's a piece of cake. By whatever technique you ascribe to in your impression taking, this facilitates accurate impression taking rather than dealing with blood and you just can't come back here and just zap that away with either electrosurgery or a laser because you haven't addressed the underlying problem, which was what tooth structure was available for the attachment of epithelium. So using simple scalpels and as I said earlier, accepted protocols of treatment, you can end up with a very beautiful high-tech result. Refining provisionals, we got to the point where the perio was done, everything was done. And 
the provisionals now form the blueprint of the finals. So that's why this, this phase is very, very important. It allows everybody to test drive the case. Family and friends can have a look at her. What do you think? Do you look like a beaver? Too big? Too small? Like, it's always too something. You want to hear all of that and be able to address it in the provisional phase. And more importantly, the occlusion is stable. She can eat, she can bite, she can chew. No clicking, no popping, no symptoms. The TMJs are just tickety-boo. Now, it's my responsibility to replicate this design in the lab phase. I have to guide the lab to give this to me in a permanent material. And in this case, it will be porous infused to metal because I think I can control, fit, and finish. And I've got bridge work in, in people's heads near 40 years, large roundhouses and porous infused to metal. So I'm inclined to stay with that. I want to capture and maintain the occlusal vertical dimension, very, very important. And it's easy to lose at any phase, particularly when all the teeth are involved. So what I like to do and what I suggest to you is to restore these things segmentally, if you can. So here, I'm going to just get an impression of the right side. Here you can see the tissue that I lopped away seven, eight months ago has healed quite nicely. I have elected to include the molar, the, the 17, because this tooth has been endodontically treated. So what I would like to do is double a butt here, double a butt here to secure those two pontics. And I know I will have good strength and worry less. I never stop worrying, but I'll be able to worry less about root fraction. So that's how I, have I want to establish the landmarks. I've got an impression. Those are the occlusal surfaces. One must be honest with oneself. And if you have an impression that isn't perfect, you better go take another one. I will get back a model on which the metal framework was constructed. I'll get a second pour of pinned dies that I will use at this appointment to make a verification jig or a solder jig. And they always throw in two or three extra pours just in case somebody drops something. So now it's my responsibility to assure accuracy of fit and to over-engineer strength. So I will always place the distal marginal ridge of the distal abutment in metal because if somebody is going to break porcelain, this is where they're going to break it. It's always at that spot. But in addition, I've got these occlusal stops which will help guide the, the fabrication of the bridge. My pontics, I don't like large ridge lap pontics. Uh, I know these are a bit small. She never complained about them. So I'm inclined to leave them small because she's worn it for several months, hasn't complained, and it makes hygiene a piece of cake for everybody. And I know I will have to play pay close attention to the distal margin of the first molar because I was very much uh, deep apically on that margin. Again, I've got good strong metal struts to resist bending, bending mo moments if she bites down on something hard so that the porcelain will be supported properly. And again, I've got a margin here on the sixth I've got a margin there on the seven, and I need to have this orchestrated so that it's cleansable over time. That's where, to remind you, that's where the decay was. Solder joints, I always have these cases sent back to me in segments. Solder joints have to be of a good surface area so you end up with a strong solder joint and often we'll split them in the middle of a pontic because that's, the, that's about the best place for, solder and for soldering. Craft of the hand, knowledge of the hand. I need to try in every single segment on the individual tooth to satisfy the 
pressure transducers in my fingers that these things go to place without a jiggle, a wiggle, or a rock. And then I know there's that sweet moment, I'm there. It will withstand the test of time, all of the moisture, bacteria, acids, etc. Assessing the fit. So here I have a metal stop, and I make sure that when they hit here, they hit here at the same time. So built into this metal framework is a very important landmark because if it's all porcelain, where do you go from there? You're just relying on, on your articulator. So there's a, there's a physical stop which is coextensive with the stop on the provisionals, same vertical dimension. Now addressing the anatomy of metal in this area. This is what they made. I know that's going to be too bulky. So I just spend some time with a, not, not a lot of time, with a green stone or some grinding instrument refining that so that there's good embrasure space. So now the patient will be able to get underneath and will be able to get underneath with instruments and, brish, and bristle brushes to keep this area clean. So I don't end up with recurrent decay. Solder index the segments and take a bite. And I like mounting these if I can in the office because I know if I mount it, I'll probably end up with an accurate mounting. I will then take that second set of pin dies and just pop them into the respective retainers, secure it with a little bit of yellow sticky wax and then plop it into some stone. And now I've created a verification jig because the all these components that are locked together fit on the teeth perfectly. So now I've indexed it with this model. So whatever the lab does now, all their soldering in and out of the furnace for porcelain fabrication, it has to fit this. If it goes down nicely on this, it will fit the teeth. And if it doesn't, then I've got to remake something. Another appointment is required to take an impression of the left side. Again, I want to capture all of these occlusal landmarks. And it's very difficult to take an entire arch accurately in one go. So I, these were long drawn out of fair appointments. So doing this segmentally actually worked out in terms of a patient acceptance, patient management perspective. So it was easy to pop in some retraction cord on four teeth. I had removed the cement from the provisional bridge. I didn't want to lock in and perhaps break something. So they came out cleanly with the impression, popped them out of the impression. Now I've got the landmarks of where the vertical dimension is. Again, very clean, defect-free impressions. And that's all made possible by that little bit of periodontal surgery in this area. Again, eliminating every weak link along the way of all these this myriad of problems that were present. The four separate crowns come back. They're the occlusal stops. The second she hits there, she hits there. I always ask them to make the middle a little high so I can shim it down. Assessing the case intraorally, let me tell you everything fit nicely. Solder indexing, the metal stops, and it's all locked down, mounted the case, sent it off to the lab. And then a third go round was required so I could get an impression for these abutments. And I'll tell you that I'm not fond of doing it this way. I'm, normally I would have them make, make the metal coping at the time that they made these abutments before I inserted them. But I didn't know where the margin would be. I didn't know that if I put in the margin, or I'm sorry, if I put in the abutment and the tissue was stressed, would, would tissue move around and then I'd get an exposed margin. 
So I thought, let me put these in into the mouth. And if I needed to redress some of the metal somewhere, and maybe I did have to, I can't recall, I'll then capture the impression. <sighs> Trying to poke retraction cord in and around tissue around an implant is very difficult. You have to be very delicate. It's, it's not the same way as putting retraction cord around the tooth. It's two different animals. Don't want to do it, but sometimes you're forced into doing it. So I've got final impression of the centrals. So I have finished framework right side, finished framework left side. I've got these two little crowns, which will be splinted. I elected to go with yellow gold. Sometimes it just, it just looks warmer around the gum line if it's yellow gold rather than silver, silver looking gold. So they were tried in. Little solder indexing, there's a metal stop. So when she hits here, she hits here simultaneously. And she also hits on that stop at the distal of the five. And she has a stop at the distal of the seven. So now I can take everything away. I've worked in the landmarks for vertical dimension in the metal framework. And I can go ahead and take my bite registration I'm not fond of this material, silicone rubber in uh, these large cases, because you start syringing here, by the time you get over to here, it's already set back here. And if the patient does one of these jaunts over to the right or left, by the time you can sort that out, the material's already starting to set. So I still use warm wax heated in a Bunsen burner. I'm told some offices don't have Bunsen burners anymore. Well, then you can't use warm wax. But warm wax is wonderful in this situation because you can take your time to help guide the mandible where, where you would like to have it. Afterwards, a pickup impression. So here are all the components related to one another as they sit on the teeth. And a master model is fabricated. And the case is completed on that master model. And it fits beautifully on the master model it fit beautifully on all of the solder jigs. So it was no surprise that it fit beautifully on the teeth. And there was no fumble on the last, that, that last yard, there was no fumble on the day of insertion. Just pop off the temporaries with the fullest confidence that this case was going to place without any issue. I was happy. And so is the patient. Yes, there's this little defect here. Um, she didn't worry about it. Certainly given all I had to work with, I wasn't worried about it either. The case was successful because of the prior anticipation and management of every detail. Everything that I could think of was on a piece of paper that was given to them. And I tried to knock all those off one by one until I got to the end line, to the end point. And she had been wearing those provisionals for six, seven, eight months. And the tissue looked like this. So you need proper provisionals to help maintain the health of tissue right to the day that it's cemented in. So I started April 5, 2019, cemented it in March 26, 2020. Teeth in a year. I'm fond of hearing about teeth in a day. I presented another case where I did teeth in a decade. So I'm getting a little faster. I'm getting a little better at it. Now I've got teeth in a year. But it took this length of time to sort out all of these problems. Who's responsible? Well, I don't need to beat you over the head on that. Obviously, it's the restoring dentist. Now, what is that responsibility? In this case, philosophically, to put the patient's needs above all else. Yes, the case exploded in terms of cost and scope of treatment, but it was comprehensive in nature because it had to be. This couldn't be a minimally invasive case. And it's to provide an accurate diagnosis, to take the time and the effort to do comprehensive treatment planning and once you elect to treat, 
you have to treat to a high standard. And it's to exemplify dedication and honesty. Because in this case, I wasn't just restoring teeth. I was restoring an individual's faith in our profession, in dentistry. Because when she first came in, it was difficult. It was difficult. And the case worked out very, very well, exemplifying dedication and honesty. I've been very fortunate to have worked with two honest and dedicated lab technicians for most of my career. The first 23 years was Gabriel Pintos. If nothing else, I hope that this series of posts attest to the fact that I sweat every little detail. And that makes me a difficult man to work with. So one day I got a case back from Gabriel. I opened it up. It was a large case, just like the one I showed, and I just didn't like the porcelain. And I would, I would speak with him two, three times a day. So I, I called him up and I just tore into him. I, I gave him both barrels. And I said, look, what gives? Like we're this far into the case. The porcelain doesn't look good. We got to remake it. And I just vented. Now, he would always call me Dr. or Dr. Belzicki. And this time he said, Belzicki, you have to go find yourself another lab. I said, what? He said, Belzicki, I'm getting close to my retirement. I'm trying to reduce the stress level and you provide me the most amount of stress. You need to go find another lab. I can't take it anymore. I tried to apologize, but he wouldn't have it. He would say, I'll, I'll you find somebody else. I'll be with you through the transition, but you gotta go find yourself another lab. But you have to promise me, I want to remain your patient forever. There was no going back. I understood and I agreed. And uh, some 10 or some eight or nine years later, about 2013, I did restore his upper arch with an implant supported case. And that is also posted on Oasis. So we've m remained friends, close friends, dental brothers, as he said, as he says, for all these years. It took me about a year to find Dennis DeMarkey. I presented myself. I took my, my computer. I opened it up, showed him all the pictures. These are the restorations I've done with Gabriel. I want it done this way. They're to, supposed to be designed that way. And I, I went through the whole thing. And then I said to him, now I'm warning you. I'm a tough man to work for. I just burned out my first lab technician of 20 years and you're next in line. So do you want this? Do you want a part of me? And he just sat back and he said, look, all I can promise you is that I will try my best. I'll redo cases any number of times at no cost until you're happy. And I thought, well, that, that's an honest approach. And I said, good. And then you have the right to call me. If there's ever a problem with an impression or you don't like the way it's prepared teeth or whatever, just call me. And if you need second or third impressions, you'll get them. And we, we moved forwards. Shortly after that, about a month or so in, he phoned me and he said, Paul, will you become my dentist? And I said, Dennis, it would be my honor. And he became a patient of the practice. And we worked together for many, many years, just like Gabriel. This is the last case that we worked on, on this case that he had a hand in. He was right in the middle of chemotherapy for lymphoma about a year and a half of chemotherapy and uh, things weren't going that well. And I called them and I said, Dennis, uh, you have to come meet with this patient. Just come select a shade, but more importantly, I seem to be stuck on the anatomy of the teeth. Having worked on this case for, for several months, you, it's easy to lose perspective and deceive yourself that what you have is actually good and appropriate. I said, would, would you please show up? And he said, on that day, I'm going down to Princess Margaret Hospital. I'll swing by the office. I'll take a look. I said, are you sure? Is it too much of a burden? He said, no, I'd love to do it. I need the diversion. It would be, it would be good to get back in the game. Fine. So he came in, 
looking a little bit frail, selected a color, and I said, what do you think of the shape of these teeth? Now, Dennis had a certain body language when he's assessing a smile. He would clasp his hands behind his back. He'd squint, he'd stick his head forwards. He'd look one way, then another. And then he'd walk around the patient from the right side and then the left side. And every time I watched this, I would wonder what is going through his mind? What criteria, what visual clues is he picking up on to make an artistic assessment of what is correct? He, he, was, he was a master at it. After a few moments, he walks behind the patient, doesn't say a word, puts up his hand and he does this. I said, okay. And I knew in my mind, I understood. I said, Paul, I gotta go, don't wanna be late for my appointment. And he left. So what, did I, what I ended up doing was correcting the cant on this. I showed this before. But a large part of why I did that was Dennis's input. Shortened up the teeth a little bit. We were able to get rid of this pink. Everything just fell into place by this simple. I'll never forget it. That little change made all the difference in the world to this case. Now, while I was working on, it, on, the, on the temporaries, it took a long time. She says to me, is there something wrong with your friend Dennis? And I said, yes. I said, he's got lymphoma. He's going through for bone marrow replacement and he's off to Princess Margaret. And she gasped and she said, oh, you know, a close family member of mine went through the same thing 10 years ago, still alive, healthy, cancer free. Please phone your friend, tell him to have faith tell him not to lose hope that everything will turn out okay. And I phoned Dennis and I told him the story. This case was inserted, as you can see, March 26, 2020. Dennis passed May 15, 2020. I called the patient. I advised her of that. <gasps> I got another gasp. Oh my God. Yes. So now this patient and I share a bond. We share the benefit of Dennis's artistry and his expertise in this case. And we share the profound sadness of his passing. These poignant moments that I share with patients, the relationships I have with staff, with, with lab technicians, particularly the two that I've mentioned, They've added immeasurably to the richness of my practice, of the experiences I have here for the past four decades. It's not by slick websites or gimmicky advertisement and promotions that we earn trust. We earn trust by demonstrating honesty, integrity, and a commitment to the patient to put them first. That's how trust is earned. I show the picture with these hands often. It signifies a few things to me. Number one is obviously the craft of the hand, but more importantly, it's the patients coming to you with their health and their well-being, and they're saying, "Please take care of me." You know, I want to. I have to put my trust in you. So, the image of these hands mean a lot. The singular trait that sets man apart from the rest of the animal kingdom is the pride and pleasure derived from exercising and pushing forward his own skills. Mine happened to be manual dexterity, craft of the hand in the service of others. And in that, I would like to thank and honor Dennis's memory. Thank you, Dennis, for lending this old school dentist a hand when he needed it most. Thank you.